We know from archaeology that prehistoric Japanese peoples had rich and varied religious beliefs. Those local beliefs and practices, notions of purity and contamination, of sacred places and dangerous places, those beliefs were expressed in stories of gods and heroes. And today, I'd like to introduce you to some of those stories. Collectively, Japan's myths are called Shinto, a word meaning way of the gods. Shinto is described as the indigenous religion of Japan, and it focuses on the veneration of human ancestors, divine beings, and natural spirits, with no clear separation of those three categories. The Japanese emperor, for example, is understood as a descendant of the sun goddess, who is both a human-like deity and a natural force. Now, you may have encountered in a history textbook or even a guidebook to Japan a nice clean distinction between Shintoism, Japan's native religious tradition, and Buddhism, a religious tradition that originated in North India. And that's a handy schematic, but it's misleading. For most of Japanese history, those two traditions were thoroughly intermingled. And before diving into the details of the Japanese case, let me give you an analogy in Western religious practice. The conventional celebration of Christian holidays in the U.S. is full of pagan symbols. The Christmas tree, for example, comes from Celtic solstice celebrations. Easter eggs reflect an ancient pagan association of eggs in spring. And I can say with textual certainty that none of the four Gospels mention fir trees at Christ's birth or chocolate eggs or bunnies at his resurrection. But the fact that modern Christianity has adopted some pagan symbols, while absolutely true, is not very useful in understanding how ordinary people experience religion. Because if we make a clear distinction between the four Gospels and pagan tradition, we come to the remarkable but wrong conclusion that most American Christians are actually not Christians at all. They are dangerous Celtic pagan heretics. Now, the same thing happens in Japan, except it's even more extreme. Japanese historical texts are full of references to the gods and Buddhas. For most Japanese, those were two complementary categories of supernatural beings. So when we're thinking about Japanese religion, I'd like you to keep in mind that Christmas tree metaphor. Because sometimes there's a technical distinction between Buddhist thought and Shinto thought, but it was invisible or irrelevant or even absurd to actual believers or practitioners. Now, Japanese mythology was codified relatively late. The earliest Japanese writings are from the 400s, and writing did not become widespread for hundreds of years. Local Japanese religious custom continued to develop by oral tradition, and it wasn't written down until 712 in something called the Kojiki, the Record of Ancient Matters. The Kojiki was the first written compilation of Japanese oral tradition, and the oldest surviving copy of the Kojiki is from the 1370s. The oldest account of Shinto religious ritual, the Engishiki, was compiled in the early 10th century. So if I wanted to be argumentative, based on written texts, I could claim that Buddhism is actually Japan's native religious tradition because there were Buddhist sutras, written prayer scrolls, in Japan before the local myths were first recorded. And looking forward, we're going to discuss in detail how Buddhism shaped Japanese culture in future lectures. But today, let's dive right into the Kojiki. And let's start with what it has to say about the origins of the universe. The Kojiki opens with three deities being born. They have very long names, such as Master of the August Center of Heaven, and they are born, and then they disappear. In some translations, they hide. 
Now, if you wanted to contrast the Shinto polytheistic tradition with the Western monotheistic tradition, that's a good place to start. Japanese deities hide. Sometimes they create things, but they also hide and vanish. And actually, these first Japanese gods don't do much of anything except be born and then hide for seven generations until the birth of the creator deities, the male deity Izanagi and the female deity Izanami. Izanagi and Izanami are ordered by the assembled Japanese gods to create the Japanese islands. So they do. And to populate the islands with gods, Izanami, the woman, says to Izanagi, the man, tell me about your body. And he says, my body has a spot that is formed to excess. How would it be if I put that in your body, in the spot that seems insufficiently formed? And she answers, great. Now, in the first translation of the Kojiki into English, in 1882, Basil Hall Chamberlain felt obliged to protect the delicate sensibilities of his Victorian audience by rendering that particular conversation in Latin. So having agreed to copulate, the couple do a courtship dance. They walk around in a circle, and Izanami says, what a handsome man. And Izanagi responds, what a beautiful lass. And they have sex, but... Their offspring is deformed. It's described as like a leech. So Izanagi asks the other gods what's wrong. And they say, this happened because the woman spoke first. Try it again, but this time have the man speak first. Now, not to overanalyze this, but remember that according to the Weiji, Japan had a shamanistic matriarchy in the late 3rd century CE. The Kojiki was compiled centuries later, after Japan had settled on a more patriarchal Confucian model of kingship. So passages like that seem to be a justification for the shift from female authority to male authority. Anyway, Izanagi and Izanami try again. And this time, Izanagi speaks first. And everything is great. The two have conjugal relations. They create lots of gods. A mountain god, a river god, a god of the plains. But when Izanami gives birth to the fire god, she is burned in the process. She falls ill and she dies. Now, Izanagi is so upset that he kills the fire god. He hacks him apart with a sword. And then, in his grief, Izanagi goes down to Yomi, the land of the dead. Chamberlain simply translated Yomi as Hades. Izanagi hopes to get his wife back. And when he finds her in the darkness of Yomi, she says to him, thank you for coming, but you're too late. I've eaten food in Yomi, so I can't go back with you. But I'll talk to the gods of Yomi to see if maybe I can get some kind of exemption. The text is cryptic here. Apparently there was a rule about eating in hell. Maybe once you ate in hell, you couldn't go back. Although apparently that rule could be changed if the hell god council agreed. And while Izanagi, the husband, is waiting for the gods of hell to finish their meeting, he lights his hair comb, his hair ornament, to see in the darkness. And he looks at Izanami and he sees that she's covered in maggots and that her body is full of thunder. What does it mean to be full of thunder? I guess you had to have been there. That's another cryptic part of this text. Anyway, Izanagi is horrified and Izanami is furious. She sends thunder gods to get Izanagi, her own husband, because he has disgraced her by looking at her. Izanagi escapes. And he seals the entrance to Yomi, to the underworld, with a huge boulder. And she curses him. And she says, I will take a thousand people from your land down to Yomi every day. And he responds, well, I will have to build 1,500 birthing huts every day. So that, according to the Kojiki, is why people are born and people die because of Izanami and Izanagi.
And finally, Izanagi bathes to purify himself after hell. And more gods are created as he washes himself. The water droplets splashing off of him become gods, including the powerful god of the wind, Susanoo, and the sun goddess, Amaterasu. Now, this is certainly a remarkable story, but consider these de details the highly non monotheistic aspects of the story. First, the Japanese gods really seem to like committees. When Izanagi isn't sure why Izanami had given birth to a leech child, the two ask a group of gods. And when Izanami wants to leave Yomi to go back with Izanagi, she asks the council from hell. The Japanese really like rule by consensus. And at the risk of generalizing about millions of people over thousands of years, the Japanese answer to a difficult problem is often try to reach a broad consensus. Historically, we find that many Japanese leaders, emperors, shoguns, daimyo, prime ministers, CEOs, are much less independent than their international counterparts. And that's because in Japan, they are expected to reflect the will of a broader ruling group. And this emphasis on consensus is found in the oldest sacred Japanese texts. Another striking thing about the Kojiki is that gods die and they go to the underworld. It's hard to imagine a starker contrast with Western monotheism. But the concept of Yomi highlights why Buddhism and Shinto have coexisted and how they have fused. They have complementary virtues. The Shinto idea of Yomi, the afterlife, is fairly bleak. You die and then you rot. By contrast, Buddhism offers a richer and more optimistic view of life after death. There is a Buddhist notion of hell, but it's for the wicked. And even the wicked get another chance because everyone is reborn. Bad people are reborn only after the torments of hell, but even they eventually can become human again and make amends. Virtuous people, by contrast, get to be reborn in more and more auspicious ways. And so Buddhist mourning consists of praying for an auspicious rebirth of the deceased. Shinto mourning, well, there is no real Shinto mourning. Instead, the emphasis is on avoiding the contamination of death. Izanagi's final actions focus on his own purification. He washes himself to cleanse himself of death. That process creates more gods. But there's no funeral in the Kojiki for Izanami. So it's something of a cliche to note that Japanese people have Shinto weddings and Buddhist funerals. But that cliché does reflect the complementary strengths of the two traditions. Okay, let's move from the myth of the creator gods, Izanagi and Izanami, to another famous legend found in the Kojiki, the story of the rock cave of heaven. As we'll see, this story is central to modern Shinto practice. It's the story of Izanagi's children, a brother and sister. The sister is Amaterasu, the sun goddess of the Shinto religion, the ancestor of the imperial line. She is worshipped at Ise Shrine, which is commonly considered the most sacred space in Shinto. Amaterasu's brother is Susanoo, the wind god. He is linked to Izumo Shrine, which is often described as the second most important shrine in Japan. And the story of the rock cave of heaven can be understood as the story of how Susanoo became number two, the second most powerful god in Japan behind his sister Amaterasu. So Susanoo and Amaterasu were created when Izanagi washed himself. And Susanoo got rowdy one day, and he started wrecking Amaterasu's stuff. He tore up her rice fields he defecated in her palace. And then he ripped the roof off of her weaving hall, and he threw in a flayed pony, and in doing so, he killed one of her weaving maidens. So Amaterasu, 
who, by the way, is the ancestor of the Japanese imperial line, she used her full godly powers to run and hide in a cave. I think this is the ultimate passive aggressive revenge, since because Amaterasu was the sun goddess, the land of the gods fell into complete darkness. And this was absolutely terrible. The gods were all very upset. They were running around in turmoil. But let's note in passing that this actually makes no sense. Because in the Kojiki, Amaterasu only became the full embodiment of the sun when she hid. Now, there must have been sunlight even before Amaterasu was born. And even though Izanami was burned when she birthed the fire god, no one else gets burned by the sun goddess. So in the Kojiki, the gods are sometimes literally natural forces, and sometimes they're just metaphorically related to natural forces. Now in later centuries, particularly in the 1700s and the 1800s, when Shinto scholars tried to push back against Chinese influence, and they tried to highlight the importance of the Kojiki as a font of unique Japanese values. They ran into problems like this passage in the Kojiki. Irrational stories. Now Confucian scholars who valued logical consistency, they pointed out that this story in the Kojiki makes no sense except as a metaphor. And the Shinto response was remarkable. Shinto scholars conceded that the Kojiki was irrational, but they argued that its incomprehensibility was actually a virtue. They said, the acts of the gods are beyond human understanding. And the strangeness of the Kojiki proved that it was true, because if human beings were making up stories, they would not make up something so ridiculous. The exact strangeness of the Kojiki, they argued, was evidence of its divine origins. And they went further. They said Confucian teachings about morality, yes, those were sensible and those were rational, but that's actually because they were designed by puny human minds for puny human minds. According to the defenders of Shinto, the internal consistency of Confucian teachings was actually a flaw, not a virtue. So keeping that in mind, that inconsistency can be a sign of divinity, let's get back to the Kojiki. So the gods are stuck in darkness. And of course, they decide to solve this problem by having a committee meeting, a big meeting of all the gods, and the gods break into groups. One group mines ore, and another smelts it to make a mirror. Another group uproots a tree, and they hang the mirror from the tree, and they decorate the tree with special cloth and with special jewels, kama-shaped jewels called magatama. The descriptions in the Kojiki are extremely elaborate. For example, his augustness, heavenly beckoning ancestor lord, and his augustness, great jewel were directed to pull out with a complete pulling the shoulder blade of a true stag from heavenly Mount Kagu. The text is so detailed because it's describing sacred rituals and special sacred places associated with specific deities. In fact, there's even a cave near Ise called Amano Iwato, the rock cave of heaven, the cave where Amaterasu supposedly hid. Now the gods assemble in front of the cave where Amaterasu is hiding, and Ame no Uzume no Mikoto, one of the gods, becomes possessed. She tears off her clothes, and she dances in front of the cave. And all the other gods crack up laughing. Amaterasu is baffled. How could they be laughing? I have caused perpetual darkness by hiding in this cave. There is nothing funny about perpetual darkness. So Amaterasu approaches the cave door to see what's going on. And the other gods lie to her and say, there is an even greater goddess than you out here. And then they hold up the tree with the mirror in front of the cave door. And when they do this, Amaterasu's light is reflected off the mirror back at her. 
and Amaterasu is baffled. Who, she wonders, is that shining goddess outside the cave? So she goes closer to look, and the gods grab her and they pull her out. And they put a special rope in front of the cave, and they order Amaterasu never to go back in. Then they confront Susano'o. They levy fines on him, and they expel him from the high plane of heaven. So let's analyze this legend from the Kujiki. What does it mean? First, as in the Izanagi and Izanami story, we see that the gods of Japanese mythology have limited powers. Amaterasu is blocked from returning to the cave by a special braided rope. Now, this has the same power that, for example, a red velvet rope that you use to, to keep people in line when entering a movie theater, the same power as that rope. In other words, Amaterasu has to follow the rules. In fact, Amaterasu is lured out of the cave by deceit, but she's still bound by the decision of the other gods. Second, many Shinto rituals are reenactments of the festivals used to lure Amaterasu out from the cave. The music and dancing associated with Shinto shrines, it's called Kagura, and it's inspired by Ame no Uzume no Mikoto's dance in front of the cave. Furthermore, if you go to a Japanese shrine today, you'll often see a woven white rope often surrounding a specific sacred space, sometimes a tree, sometimes a stone, and that rope is derived from the rope that the gods used to keep Amaterasu from re-entering the cave. It still works today as a symbolic barrier. And it's worth noting that the sacred regalia of the imperial house are a sword, a mirror, and a curved jewel. Ise Shrine supposedly has the very mirror used to trick Amaterasu. So this is a seminal story for Shinto practice. Finally, let's consider the legend historically. For example, Amaterasu does not recognize herself in a mirror. And that seems absurd. Elephants recognize themselves in mirrors, so do whales. But this makes more sense if we think of this account as perhaps of something that happened in the late Yayoi era kingdom, when a mirror was a rare and exotic gift from the continent, something even a ruler might rarely see. The banishment of Susanoo is also intriguing because we know from archaeology that Izumo was once a thriving and wealthy kingdom on the coast of the Sea of Japan. Today it's in Shimane Prefecture. One archaeological dig unearthed hundreds of bronze swords and spears at Izumo. And there are recent reconstructions of the ancient shrine at Izumo. The original platform was hundreds of feet in the air, and a long staircase rose from the sea to an elevated sacred space. So from all this, we can conclude that Izumo was a powerful kingdom, and the shrine there was very important. But at some point, probably in the 500s or the 600s, the people of Izumo were defeated by a kingdom near present-day Nara and Kyoto, a kingdom associated with the sun goddess. Now, Izumo was too powerful to be eliminated from mythology, so instead, the shrine there was subordinated. So let's see how this plays out in the Kojiki. So as we've seen, Susanoo was punished and he was expelled from the high plane of heaven. But he still gets to be heroic down on earth. In fact, his exploits in Izumo, down on earth, are quite spectacular. Susanoo lands in Izumo, and he says, basically, I've been expelled from heaven, what's going on down here? And he is told by the locals that there was a monstrous serpent, eight valleys long, with eight heads and eight tails, and this monster is eating all of the maidens in the land. So Susanoo tells the local people to brew some liquor and to refine it eight times and then pour it into eight vats. And when the serpent drinks the liquor, it gets drunk. And then Susanoo kills the serpent. And while he's hacking it apart, he breaks his sword on the tail and he finds in the serpent's tail another sword. And this is, of course, a magic sword. 
But then Susanoo reports his exploits to Amaterasu, and he offers her the sword. That's a clear sign of his subordination to the sun goddess. Susanoo's conquests on Earth become her conquests. In short, Susanoo defers to the sun goddess and thus confirms her legitimacy. Now we can read this legend as a political metaphor. So a coalition of clans centered on the sun goddess and based in the area that's now the, the Kyoto Nara area, they defeated the rulers of Izumo, the kingdom of the wind god. But as part of a peace deal, the Izumo clans retained some local control. And therefore, in Japanese mythology, Susanoo is still a hero, even after he's expelled from heaven, because in the end he's deferential to Amaterasu. This is, in legendary format, a description of a political compromise between two rival kingdoms. The rulers of Izumo can still be dragon slayers in their own mythology so long as they recognize the sun goddess as their superior. So underneath all these supernatural exploits, the stories of the Kojiki can actually be read as political legends. These are the stories of rival clans with rival gods coming together into a single kingdom with a single mythology. Now, part of the inspiration for compiling the Kojiki in the 700s was to use these stories to support Japanese kingship. Ancient Japan's emperors claimed descent from these gods as part of their mandate to rule. And what's remarkable about the Japanese monarchy is that it still draws legitimacy from these ancient myths. The reigning emperor in Japan still enjoys a special connection to Amaterasu, the sun goddess. And when these ancient myths are fused with modern political practice and modern political sensibilities, the results are quite often very strange. For example, in 1990, when Emperor Akihito formally ascended the throne, the foreign press did not quite know what to make of his Dajosai a ceremony in which the new emperor communes with the spirit of Amaterasu. There's a ritual bath, special foods, including sacred rice, but the most intimate rituals are closed to the public. And some Japanese scholars have observed that because there is bedding in the inner sanctum, the new emperor's connection with Amaterasu involves some sort of symbolic sexual union. The imperial household agency insisted that while Amaterasu does indeed rest on the bed, the new emperor does not touch the bed. Nonetheless, even though foreign reporters tried to be respectful, the emperor's connection to the ancient gods just seemed a little bit weird and kinky. Of course, 45 years earlier, in 1945, the same imperial connection to the ancient gods had seemed very different. Then Emperor Hirohito's connection to the ancient gods was seen as militaristic, fascistic, and dangerous. The US occupation insisted that Hirohito renounce his divinity, and he dutifully read a proclamation declaring that he was not a living god. Now I think this range of Western interpretations, going from a little bit weird to downright fascistic, are symptoms of trying to connect ancient rituals to modern politics. And we'd probably have the same problems in Europe if, for example, the King of Sweden claimed to have Thor's hammer or some other direct link to the Norse gods. Or if the King of England, upon taking the throne, had a ritual meeting with the spirit of King Arthur complete with a symbolic handover of the sacred sword Excalibur. So what's distinctive about the Japanese case is not that Japanese mythology is uniquely strange. It's that in Japan, the remote and distant past is not that remote and distant. Instead, particularly in the case of institutions like the imperial house, we find that ancient rituals are still a part of contemporary life.